People always ask me, okay, Ibriz, you're an American. Why in the world would you choose to work as a doctor in the United Kingdom versus in the USA? And let's be real, as an American, I pretty much grew up believing this. History began on July 4th, 1776. Everything before that was a mistake. <laughs> So let's go through my 10 reasons for choosing to work as a doctor in the United Kingdom versus the United States of America. If this is the first time you're checking out our channel, welcome. Basically what we do is we run a website that's totally free known as roadtouk.com and it will explain the ins and outs about everything related to the United Kingdom and what it takes for you to work as a doctor in the NHS. So if you've not already, please stalk us on all of our social media. Find us on Facebook, find us on Twitter, Instagram, and of course YouTube. Don't forget to subscribe. Hi guys, my name is Debris and I currently work as an internal medicine trainee in the United Kingdom in the NHS. So let's start off with reason number one. Reason number one is that there is better pay and better pay for hours along with better working hours in the United Kingdom. And I'm sure you're like, Ibriz, look, look, we're not going to take this. Everyone knows in the US, everyone there, all the doctors, they make oodles and oodles of money. What are you telling us? It's just one of those things, I think. I think, you know, how a rumor starts or how people believe things to be and they don't really necessarily understand the intricacies of, of what's being asked and how that pay is actually being broken down. Now, I'm not going to go too much into the pay of the UK. We've got a video that covers that. But what I will kind of get you to understand is what I've been talking about when it comes to better working hours and better pay per hour. So in the United Kingdom, I am not expected to work more than an average of 48 hours a week. Yes, there might be some weeks where I'm going to be working more hours than that, but to even that out, I will be working less hours in another week. All right. So that whole, you know, oh, averaging 80 hours a week type thing, 80 to 100 hours. No, 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 no. I'm talking about average hours, guys. Okay. So like I said, there might be a one off or a, a certain weeks where you're going to be doing more on calls that will it'll add up a little bit higher than what you're used to, but it won't ever average out to more than 48 hours in that week. The reason for this is something known as the European work time, working time directive. All right. Now you do have the option to opt out of it and make it up to 56 hours, but you really are not going to be doing more than that. So the way that the UK system really works is it's, it's pretty centralized. Yes, of course, there's England, there's Wales, there's Scotland, there's Northern Ireland, and they all have a little bit of variation in their rules and regulations for the junior doctor's contract. But overall, it's not that different and you can pretty much expect the same type of hours and expectations within the contract, no matter where you are in the UK. On the other hand, yes, in the United States, the hospitals do have to report to one body that regulates and make sure that they're doing what they need to be doing. But see, that's the thing. It's the hospital's responsibility. While in the UK, we have these things called deaneries and these hospitals or these trusts make up the deanery. And then these deaneries are what actually are being regulated overall. So you can expect that in the UK, you don't really have to stress about oh, this specific hospital or, or that specific hospital, unless that's something that you're really, you know, wanting to do because of you want to live in that area. Because within that deanery, they have expectations they must maintain. So in the United States, you will hear that a lot. You will say people will be like, oh, but this hospital, it doesn't have a lot of training opportunities or, or this hospital, they're not IMG friendly because they don't sponsor visas or a lot of IMGs don't go there. But that's not something that occurs in the United Kingdom because they sponsor visas for everyone, regardless of your nationality. And because they have that kind of thing to maintain, they are told when they need to be doing things a certain way, if things need to be improved. Now, when we're talking about specifically when we're looking at the pay in the United Kingdom, your basic pay is something that's reflected at whatever level you're working at. And while this basic pay may vary a little bit if you're living in, you know, you know, Scotland or Wales or Northern Ireland or England, the basic pay within those areas are the same. So if you are an intern in Southwest England, you'll be making the same basic pay as an intern in Northwest England and so on and so forth, because what they're concerned about is at the level that you're working at. The money that's added on top of that will be, of course, your on calls or anything extra that you will be doing as part of your roster. So this basic pay is that was what's then tabulated and calculated. And of course, with taxes and everything like that, that's what you're making every month. Now, 
where I think a lot of people get confused is they'll look at the basic pay in the in the UK because it's usually just the basic pay that you will find when you search how much a doctor will get paid and they'll be like this is nothing this isn't any money at all but like I said you're just looking at the basic pay but not everyone in the United Kingdom has to start as a intern especially if you're an international medical graduate so that pay level may not even be something that you need to ever worry about and of course like I said if you are doing certain on calls depending on how demanding your rota is there will be extra supplemental pay that goes on top of that basic pay you may think well all right but a breeze when I look at this hospital in the US let's say you know in Houston they're saying that at, at, at a starting level I can get paid thirty five thousand dollars a year but New York is saying they'll pay me fifty thousand dollars a year so I should definitely try and get into the residency program in New York see there's not standardization of the pay across the US again because they are decentralized and what you have to understand is areas where there may be more pay in that sense may also be because there's a higher cost of living the UK equivalent of this would be if you're living in London, if you're working in London, they give you something extra known as London waiting. But when you actually look at the hours you're working put together into how much you're being paid per that hour, you will find that in the UK you will be making substantially more than you'll be working you would be making in the United States for the simple reason that you're working less hours for that pay. I really hope that makes sense. I know a lot of times we get kind of confused about, well, how much is this? How much is that? Because we're not actually trying to understand the overall, you know, where does this money coming from? How is it being divided? And where does it go? I would recommend you check out Ibrahim's video about his payslip where he breaks down where that cost goes into. And you can see the cost per hour, sorry, the pay per hour and what it means overall with his on calls. But what I want to make crystal clear in this situation is do not take the salaries that you see on the internet at face value. It is much more than that. You may see that a certain hospital in the United States is paying their PGY1s maybe 60, 65,000 a year, and some other hospitals paying their PGY1s maybe only 30, 35,000 a year. And you might be wondering why would anyone want to work at any of those other hospitals? But like I said, it's much more than just money that you're getting and that somebody's being paid more in that state there are more things that go into it in the same way in the united kingdom just because you're seeing somebody's basic pay doesn't mean that's all that they're taking home to give you an idea of what my take home is on a monthly basis and i would be about the equivalent of a pgy2 pgy3 in the united states is on average individuals can expect to take home between 2700 to 3200 pounds per month and the reason for this variation is of course the demand of their on-call rota but it is not unusual to make even a little bit more than that depending on how many on calls that you have so that's reason number one guys and let's move on to reason number two reason number two i found the uk system to be much more supportive than the us system and that doesn't mean to say that you won't find any support in the united states but I found, again, because of how they centralize everything, you can really get a lot of support, whether you are a training doctor or not in the United Kingdom. You've got clinical supervisors, you've got educational supervisors, you've got a post-grad medical center. You know, depending on what your deanery is, you've got somebody there as your program director, you have, um, you know, your royal colleges, all of those individuals at any time, if you get confused, there are people that you can reach out out to aside from that you've got unions you can join that offer support and of course your indemnity uh, unions as well who are there to help you out in case you have any confusion or anything like that and on top of this I mean and again I, I've, I'm sure there's an element of bias to this and people may say otherwise but I personally felt the amount of supportive even Facebook groups or WhatsApp groups or individuals in general on different forums who are there to help you along the way who are willing to listen to you if you have any concerns I found that the UK offered more of that than the United States. I don't know necessarily why that is, but it is something that I felt was was very clear to me. And I know, you know, I, being an American, maybe I didn't need as much support in the US. And if I'm saying I didn't feel that there was much support, I don't know how much support that would necessarily be available for international graduates. But as an international graduate coming to work in the UK, I did feel like there was a lot of options out there of who I could ask and who I could turn to. So now let's move on to reason number three, structured training and training that you don't have to pay for. All right, let's let's first talk about the money because I feel like everybody's heard that and their ears are picked up. Like, all right, what I mean by that is 
in the United States, when you apply for the residency programs, when you apply for the match, you have to pay like every step of the way, guys. And if you're an IMG, I've heard from a lot of my friends that it's a pretty pricey thing that you have to, you know, invest in because you want to, you know, apply for a ton of programs. And this again breaks down to the centralization and decentralization aspects of, of both of these countries. So you don't pay for anything in the United Kingdom when you're applying for training. In fact, they will reimburse you for any costs that you incurred in the entire process. Let me tell you a little bit about my experience. So when I applied for internal medicine training, they gave me, you know, I, I uploaded my portfolio and everything onto the system and they were like, all right, congratulations, you've been shortlisted for an interview. Here are the places you can come for the interview. It is one interview that is done on a national level. I do not have to attend multiple interviews that are hospital specific because like I said, it's a national recruitment process, not a hospital specific recruitment process. So I chose an area and because it was pretty far away, I mean, I had to take a train and I had to find place to be. And of course there's food involved, right? Cause I have to have breakfast, I have to have lunch. They gave me a form that said, oh, you had to travel, you, you needed accommodation and you needed sustenance. So please fill out this form and attach the receipts and we will pay you back. That's pretty great. At least in my opinion, I think that's really great. And then I basically had to attend that one interview and that was it. No more interviews needed. Nothing else I had to stress about that. Oh, this interview, then I have to go to that interview. I have to be in this end of the country. I have to be at that end of the country. There was nothing involved in the sense of having to meet people from a specific hospital or having like a pre-interview dinner, post-interview dinner, what have you. Now you might be like, well then Breeze, then how do you choose where you want to go? Do they just randomly select you and throw you wherever? No, of course not. What ends up happening is, yes, you get a score based on your portfolio and your interview. And just like you would rank in your residency program, you will be ranking here as well, which hospitals you'd want to go to and which ones you're not interested in. But the difference being you have the availability of all the hospitals in that training program at no cost to you. You can rank which one you want as number one, which one you want as number two, which one you want as number three. If there's a particular region that you don't want to apply to, you can even get rid of them and say, no, I actually don't want to apply to those regions at all. You don't have to worry about what place will offer a visa because that's not a problem in the UK. There are no specific programs or specific hospitals that will sponsor your visa. Everyone will sponsor your visa versus in the United States, where of course, like I said, you have to pay for the match and the residency application process, um, your ERAS token, so many little things. And like I said, of course, most people will apply to, for like between 150 to 250 programs and that adds up because it's, it's, you're paying for the, the application process. Now, structured training, what do I mean by structured training? In the United States, you have to get into your residency program and then that's it. You're in that residency program, you know, you're a resident, then you're a fellow and then you're an attending. That's their form of structure. But the UK, I find their structure to be a little bit more flexible and something that will allow a lot of individuals from all walks of life to actually enter into the program. So you have the option in the United Kingdom to start out as an intern and in what is known as the UKFP program. If you want to do your internship in the, U in the United Kingdom, you have the option. If you've already completed an acceptable pattern of internship and your program of training is as such, you can start at a core training level. Or if you are otherwise pretty well versed and you know what's going on, you can start. You have the option to start at a specialty training level. And in some situations, in some programs, if you are really, really experienced and you have everything to show for it, you could even directly start as a consultant. And that is known as the CESR program, but that's something completely different. But what I want you to understand here is if you're an individual, let's say you've got a couple of years of experience back home and you've already completed an acceptable pattern of internship, you don't have to start at the very bottom. Unlike in the United States where you would be told, actually, you need to start at PGY1. You need to be an intern all over again and run through the entire process again. So sometimes when I hear people say that training's really long in the UK versus the US, I wonder how that can really be for certain situations, especially because you don't have to go through the entire process again. You can potentially take out a lot of your training time, depending on your experience and depending on the training that you're applying for. And because in, at least in my opinion, it's so much easier to apply into training and the chances of you getting into the training process in the United Kingdom is substantially more than in the United States. You don't spend a lot of time reapplying for the match. And I think a lot of times people don't put that 
into their equation of how long it'll take me to become an attending in the US. Well, I personally know some people who it took them three or four attempts just to get into the residency program, and they're not counting those three years into the, their whole training. And I wonder why, because at that level, if somebody had started, let's say at a core trainee level, they'd already be more or less done or halfway done with their training in the United Kingdom. But that's a, that's a bigger discussion for another day. Really, I just find that the training program in the UK has a little bit more structure to it in that sense because of that flexibility. And of course, if you can prove your competencies, that is what they are most interested in. How competent are you? You know, where can your experience put you? You don't have to feel that you have to start at the very bottom. You, of course, can if you meet the criteria to do so. Nobody will stop you. But of course, it's not something that you must do. Reason number four. In the United States, there is no such thing as a non-training doctor. If you're not a resident, if you didn't match, you're plumb out of luck until you can get into the residency program. But that's not a thing in the United Kingdom, and I think that's really nice. Like, if you choose to, you don't ever have to enter training in the UK, and nobody will be mad at you, nobody will judge you and ask you why. You can be a non-training doctor and still have all of the same opportunities and pay of a training doctor. It's pretty great. I mean, yeah, sure. You're not going to have the extra training days that a trainee will get, but you will still be fine to go to departmental teachings, to go to the grand rounds, to attend seminars, to attend conferences, to do whatever you would like. And you don't have to be in a structured training program. Most international medical graduates will work as a non-trainee for some time in the NHS to get some experience and then join training. Some choose to never join training and that's completely fine because you can do whatever you want. And if you feel like, actually, I've, I've had a lot of years of experience back home. I don't want to join into a, a training post and do all of that all over again. I'm fine as a non-trainee at this level in this speciality or in this department. By all means, you would still have a, a form of progression. You have appraisals that they'll be checking on what you need to do. And of course, you can progress in any other way when you speak to your to your hospital and see what they are asking of you. But overall, versus the US, if you don't get into a training program there, you have to wait every year until you do get into a training program. If in the UK you're like, okay, I didn't get into the training program this year, what do I do? You can work as a non-trainee until you can reapply. Reason number five, locum opportunities. No one will say no to a little extra money. So locuming, or what's known in the US as moonlighting, are basically you're taking extra shifts where they need doctors and they are willing to pay you at a higher rate than normal. Now, from what I've understood in the United States, you need to have some form of a settled visa status, all right, like a green card or citizenship or something like that, before you're allowed to moonlight. And if I'm not mistaken, there are a lot of other kind of stipulations as to who can and cannot moonlight even after that. And the opportunities are not as great as they are in the United Kingdom. So in the UK, it doesn't matter if you're on a working visa, you can still locum. No one will stop you from locuming. In fact, they will probably highly encourage it because they need doctors working in a lot of places. You can generally expect to make between 30 to 75 pounds an hour as a locum in the UK. The variation is because of the level that you'll be working at. So of course, if you're a higher registrar, you could be making the higher end of that range. But if you're a lower, you know, junior doctor-esque, you would be making towards the, the lower end, end of that range. But it's still a good chunk of money you can put away, especially if you're doing an eight hour shift or a 12 hour shift. I mean, you're looking at a good chunk to put in your pocket. So the locum opportunities are great ways for you to add to your already monthly salary. And because in the UK, we really don't work that many weekends or we finish at a certain time, you, you know, maybe you, it's one day you're working from nine to five and uh, the rotor coordinator sends out an email and says, actually guys, we need somebody who can work from five to 10 PM on this shift. And you're like, hmm, well, I'm not doing anything. Let's go do that extra shift. Or perhaps there's a weekend available and they're like, we need somebody to work this entire weekend. And you're like, yeah, that sounds good. Let's do that. Of course, they'll keep you within the working directive of how many hours you should be working. But other than that, there's really nothing stopping you from, from locuming. You can locum on days off if it means that you're mess not messing up those hours. You can locum on your vacation days. You can locum at different hospitals, if you, even if they're not hospitals that you work at. So what I'm saying is locum opportunities, better in the UK. Reason number six is a pretty big reason, in my opinion, 
the NHS as a whole, a national healthcare service, guys. Can you just imagine not having to stress out at your point of care? Do you have an insurance card with you? How much money is in your pocket? Can you pay for whatever you need? I mean, I did a whole video about my experience in the NHS and honestly, it was an eye-opening experience. If you've never had to experience that whole, do I have enough to pay for myself or pay for my care? Do I have the kind of healthcare that'll allow me to get sick? You will not understand the amount of stress that goes into that situation. And it's honestly so wonderful to know that you are someone who could afford an individual that kind of care. You are not stressing out about their insurance eligibility or what they can or cannot pay for or, or what would their insurance let them have by means of a service or a scan or which hospitals even accept their insurance. You don't have to worry about anything like that at all. You're just worried about what does this patient come in with and what's wrong with them and how can I fix them and make them better. And that for me is a tremendous, tremendous boon about working in the UK because of the National Healthcare Service because there is something like that that's taking care of so many people and not just others, it's taking care of you as well. You working in the United Kingdom, you are covered by the NHS and not just you. Oh, there's more. Your dependents, your spouse, your children, they don't have to worry about it either. You don't have to buy separate health insurance for them. You are covered by the NHS. Yes, you are paying taxes, you're paying a national insurance, which goes into your coverage. But on top of that, there's no longer any sort of health surcharge that you would have to pay as a working doctor in the NHS. And that's just wonderful. Imagine, especially for those of you with kids, everyone knows kids get into bumps, bruises, scrape up, this and that. That whole stress is just lifted knowing that at the point of care, everything is completely covered. And not only is it great for you, but it's great for your patients as well. Reason number seven, we're gonna talk about all the types of leave that you can get. By leave, I mean annual leave or vacation days, study leave, bank holidays, so many little things that really you don't think about. So in the United States, in a lot of hospitals, you'll find that there is fixed vacation days, which, is, which means that you are told, actually guys, here's a whole year, you can get two weeks here, two weeks there, or maybe four weeks altogether, but you need to pick these dates before anyone else picks them because that's it. And you do that at the beginning of the year. It doesn't work like that in the NHS. What happens here is in the UK, what you're going to be asked is, all right, all right, you're working in this rotation for four months. You get nine days of annual leave. It's typically about nine days per four month rotation. But if you've got a longer rotation, those days will increase. A couple of weeks in advance, you let the rotor coordinators know, I want these days to these days off. Boom. If maybe you're on nights or, you know, on another form of on call, they'll look for swaps boom, you've got your annual leave. Because we're very rarely working any weekends, you can be really smart about it and line it up such that you can get an extended period of time off because you've planned your annual leave in between those weekends where you're not working. So you've got your weekends off, you've got your annual leave, you've got some more weekends off, you've got some more annual leave. Look at that, extra days that you don't have to worry about. And of course, you're paid on this time for your annual leave, for your vacation days. You might wonder why I'm saying that, but people have asked us that previously. If you're on your vacation days, you are still getting paid. Then we've got study leave. Study leave, if you want to attend a program or a conference or some sort of teaching opportunity to go do something and expand your knowledge, you can ask for study leave for that purpose. And with it comes a study budget. If you're a trainee or a non-trainee, you can see within your hospital how much your budget is, but it's really good, especially if you want to do courses like, you know, ALS or ILS or anything really that's specific to whatever you're trying to to, to work towards, it can be covered by your study budget. You go attend and then you give them um, your, your, the chit back saying, you know, this is the receipt. And of course, guys, if you had to travel, if you had any food that you had to eat, if there was an accommodation, all of that, imagine, covered. And this study leave, again, depending on where you are, can also be just national or even international part of the budget, which is really great. Another thing about study leave, which I found out is really cool. Now let's say you want to attend some conference and it's on a Saturday and you're not working that Saturday, but you really want to go to this conference. So you still apply for your study leave because of course you're paying for it and you want to get reimbursed, but you learn something really awesome. You get another day back in lieu, which basically means because you went to this conference, it's effectively considered a working day. So they have to give you that day back off. So, the first time that happened to me, it was so great because I was just like, I didn't even know this was a thing. So you get your day back. 
You also get your days back if you're working bank holidays. So if it's a bank holiday in the UK and you're working that day, they give you another day off in lieu that can be added towards your annual leave and then you've got more annual leave as such. So yeah, I'm not saying that the US doesn't have study leave or study budget, but I have not found them to be as flexible or accommodating as they are in the UK. And I don't think I've ever heard of lieu days in the US, but I could be wrong. And on top of that, to be honest, I don't ever remember not having to work a bank holiday. I think the way the bank holidays here are actual proper bank holidays, like we're not fully staffed, it's not really a thing in the United States. So that is another thing to keep in mind. Reason number eight, a lot of international medical graduates email us stressed out wondering how can they start a family or how can they, they work when they're trying to start a family. So the UK has a pretty great mat leave or maternity leave, paternity leave, and something known as shared parental leave. And I'll talk just a little bit about it because it's honestly much more than this video can cover. So imagine you can basically, if I really tried to just sum it up, in a certain period of time, if you meet the eligibility and whatever else they ask of you, if you are the woman who is pregnant and is going to have the child, um, you can say, hey, actually from this date to this date, I need to be on maternal, ma maternity leave and you'll be paid for a certain duration of that time. And then there's a breakdown of how much of that pay will be full pay, half pay, so on, what forth. Even if you don't get paid for the, the certain duration of it, you, you're still allowed that leave. And for paternity leave, if I'm not mistaken, it is two weeks. But there is that option of shared parental leave, which again, bigger discussion this, than this video, but, but basically both individuals can take shared leave and spend time with your new bundle of joy. And I think that's a really great thing. In the US, I mean, you can ask anyone, mat leave, pat leave is a pretty hot point of contention. It's not nearly as flexible or as nice as it is in the United Kingdom but that is like for another whole video. But in general, guys, it's so nice to know that you could be supported in that time to, to work, to take some time off, to have your child, to spend those early precious months with your child and still not have to worry about your job. And in that vein, we go to the reason number nine, something that is known as less than full time. It's very flexible here in the UK. You don't have to work at 100%. Even if you're a trainee or a non-trainee, they have something that's known as less than full time, which basically means you're working less than full time. And you just say, look, I've got a kid, let's say for instance, and I can't work all the time because I, I need to take them for this, I need to take them for that. And the spouse also needs to do this or that. So both of y'all, if you're both working in the NHS, it's possible for you to both go less than full time. You can say, all right, um, I wanna go less than full time and only work 60%. All right, and you can speak to your trust or your hospital and see how that can be worked out. Sometimes what individuals do is to keep at generally a hundred percent, but working less days per week. What they'll do is what they'll work longer hours. Say, so let's say if normally you work nine to five, they will work from eight to six. So it'll make up by the end of that week as if they had worked for five days, but only actually working four. That's also an option. And yeah, I get it with less than full time. Your training may be extended a little bit. Your pay will be a little bit less but you can still locum if you need to within, of course, the stipulations. And guys, I mean, you're spending all that time doing something else that I think is more important, spending some time with your family. And you can always revert back to 100% if you wanted to. There are even consultants who work less than full time. And I think that's so nice to always have that level of flexibility at any stage of your career, because really guys, the job's not everything. You want to spend time outside of the hospital doing other more exciting things. And Finally, reason number 10, the biggest reason why I chose to work in the United Kingdom as a doctor and not in the United States of America, guys, it's the rat race. Ah, things are so relaxed in the UK. I don't have somebody kind of, you know, stressing me out every time saying, why aren't you doing this? Why aren't you progressing this way? Why aren't you already an attending or a consultant? What do you mean you want to take some time off and training and do something else and or maybe just locum for a year or two it's so nice in the u.s you get on a train and you get off of that train when you become an attending there's no in between if you didn't get into you know your residency you, you keep waiting to get onto that train if you didn't get into that fellowship 
you're stressing out trying to get into something. See, because there's nothing you can be doing in that time in between. Maybe, yeah, you'll do some research, you'll put some publications together, but you can't be working as a doctor because you're not already in a structured program. The UK, so let's say, you know, I finish my, my training this year for internal medicine training, which is at a core level, and then I would be applying for a registrar type of training. Well, maybe I don't want to do that. Maybe I want to spend a year being a non-trainee in some other department or something that I feel like I want to learn a little bit more about. Maybe I want to spend a year doing locums if my visa allows me to do so. You aren't bound to do anything. And it's really great, even with the local graduates, you'll find here they're just so relaxed about it. And I enjoy that kind of relaxed approach to medicine. I feel that in the US, a lot of us don't enjoy the journey and this progression of becoming a more well-rounded doctor. All we're staring at is the end of the line to get and cross that checkpoint and be like, yes, now I'm here, we're here, we're done, we're done, we're done. But the UK is more about, all right, now we're at this stage and what are we learning at this stage and how can we improve ourselves at this stage? There's so many consultants here who have spent 10, 15 years becoming a consultant at their own volition. They're just taking their time. And do you know what? I wouldn't have known that unless they told me that. The minute you become a consultant, no one's gonna ask you, hey, how long have you been a consultant for? It's not that big a deal. I mean, I think if you can enjoy the process, if it means you're spending time with your kids, if you're spending time with your family, if you're traveling, if you're expanding your horizons in different educational opportunities, why stress yourself out? Why tell yourself, I've got to do all of this in this short amount of time, otherwise the world will end? Because guys, the world won't end. Have fun, do things that you wanna do. Like, like what we do with Roads UK. People ask us, how do we have time to do this? Well, we have time because our working hours are really great. We don't always have to be working weekends. We get time off of the hours after we work them, um, if we work any on calls or long shifts, and people are just generally more relaxed. I'm not saying the UK doesn't have expectations. If you're in a training program, you have a portfolio to maintain, you have things you have to do to show your competencies and progress. But at the same time, I feel like the educational support that is offered to you, if you're confused about anything, if you need extra help, it's a little bit more. And people will not look down on you if you say, I want some time out of training. No one will ask you, well, how come you've still not joined in training or you've not become a consultant yet? Or if you don't become a consultant at all, if you want to be a speciality doctor or an SAS doctor and just be like a senior registrar, nobody's gonna question that. Nobody's gonna say, why are you doing that? If you wanna stay at a trust grade, non-training level or just locum your entire life, no one will say, how come you're doing that? No one will make you feel bad about doing that. It's your life and you are completely within your rights. Choose your course of action and what you want to do. So for me, that was a very big part of it. And honestly, guys, all these little things that I've mentioned really do all mean a lot in the long run. Yes, we're young today, but do you want to be living that kind of life forever where you're always pressurized to do this, that you've always got to take time off and this much you know, of, of availability where you're wondering, well, okay, if I want to do this, can I still be able to do that? Will I have that flexibility, that time to spend, to do things, to go places, to see the world? All of this should mean more to you, in my opinion, than any job. Because yeah, fine, you live in, you're working, but they can find somebody else to do that job. And I think that's something that's very important for you to remember. You shouldn't dedicate 100% of your time towards a job where they can just find a replacement. Instead, you should spend most of your time doing things that, that can't be replaced. Spending time with your family, spending time with your children, or just spending time on your hobbies, doing things that you enjoy doing outside of work. Really, it is at the end of the day, your decision, do you want to work in the United States? Do you want to work in the United Kingdom? It's just so many people have asked me why I chose the UK over the USA and really it's it's come down to these reasons guys I'm sure there are more I'm sure some people will be like Reese, you're so crazy you could have been in the US and been doing other things and maybe making tons and tons of money maybe but I don't think so I've looked at it I've weighed my options I've made my pros and cons list and I think this is the thing that's most sensible for me and in the long run the most pragmatic so I would encourage you to do the same thing as well if you're stuck if you're wondering I'm in the US maybe I should think about the UK I'm in the UK maybe I should think about the US 
But never, never let yourself think that one option is less than the other. Both options are good for you if you find that they meet your requirements. No one is a better doctor working in one country versus the other. No one is a better person for pursuing one route versus the other. If anyone's making you feel that way, they are the lesser person, honestly, because that is a horrible way to think, especially in a profession like ours where we are dedicated to helping others. So that's me, and those are my reasons, guys. I hope you enjoyed this video and it was useful for you and your future thoughts and wonderings about what you should do with your life. And if you've not already, guys, please subscribe to our YouTube channel, follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, and we'll see you next time. Bye.